All right, so this presentation is on giving computation a type. Um, I have an alternative title. It's for what do nullables, arrays, callbacks, promises, exceptions, and side effects have in common, among other things. Um, there's also a third title, but that's for the end. <laughs> so um, if we consider this code here, hopefully that's big enough. Can you guys see it? Okay. Um, most of the code in here happens to be JavaScript, but hopefully that won't confuse anybody. Um, it's more about the structure of the code. Um, so here, we're going to call get data. That's what we care about doing. We're going to store the result. Then we're going to get some more data. And then once we have both of those things, then we're going to use it. Does that make sense? OK. So the first thing I mentioned in the long title was nullables. So if we're working in a language, where values can be null, then here's how we might deal with that. Um, if get data can return null, then we have to check to see if it's not null. Um, so that's our first step, check to see if it exists. Then we can perform our actual next step that we care about doing. Then we check to see if that exists. And then we perform our final step. So the thing I want to point out here isn't the stuff that was in the last slide. It's the stuff that we've added to this slide. Stuff that isn't related to getting the data, but we had to do, like it changed the structure of our code. Um, also, there are now two return paths. Before, there was only one. So things to note. Next, we've got arrays. Um, I've used a for loop instead of for each, um, mostly just to show the similar structure. Um, we've got a similar first step for each item implicitly that exists. We're going to do some stuff. Um, so I put the, that exists there to show that it's similar to the other step. Um, the only real difference is that we're going to execute the body potentially multiple times. Uh, then we perform our next step, which happens to also be a loop. And then we have results, but we're going to do it many times in this case. Next, we've got exceptions. Um, this looks pretty similar to our original code, but now it's got a try-catch around it. This is actually very similar to the, the if case. Um, we're still doing checks on each line, but they're now implicit in the try. So every line that executes, it's going to check to see if an exception was thrown, and then continue. Um, same as before. Callbacks. Um, this is a little bit different in structure, um, but it ends up actually behaving in a pretty similar way. Instead of checking to see if something exists, we're going to wait for some external caller to decide when it's time to run the next step. And then again, we do the next step, wait again, and then use both values. Now we have callbacks and exceptions, but they're mixed together in this case. This is pretty common, especially in older node stuff. Um, you get the error passed in as your first argument. Um, we've got a default value if that's the case. So now, we've got the same sort of structure, but we're checking two things this time. Next, we have promises. Um, promises are the abstraction of that callback thing. So instead of you know drilling down, we get to build more of a chain. Um, they're basically the same as tasks in C sharp, or I don't know if you have a similar thing in Swift. Um, but basically here, we still have the error handling, but it's at the end. Um, and we still have our three steps, but two of them are like nested inside these thens. And lastly, we have async and await, um, which is really just syntax sugar for the thing on the left side. It's exactly the same thing, almost. Now it's the same thing. <laughs> um, so what happens to our nice simple version a second ago? We had just that simple async await block that was doing just what we wanted. And then we had to add try catch back in there to handle the error case. So what were we really after? Well, if we take our original code and we kind of write it in this pseudocode sort of format, we have a step and then we take out the value. We've got a step and we take out the value and then we use both of those values. Okay, so what could be some possible definitions for this magic left arrow. 
Well, if we're dealing with nullable things, then it's going to unwrap the value into A if it's not null. If it is, then the whole thing short circuits. Uh, if it's arrays, then we're going to map every step after that through the map each item of the, of the array through each step below that line, basically. So this ends up behaving exactly the same. Um, if we do that, we get a list in A, uh, but it's going to be each item one at a time. And then we're going to do the next two steps for each one of those items. And finally, exceptions, we're going to, oh, not finally. Uh, we're going to unwrap the value if no exception was thrown, pretty similar to if. Callbacks, promises, async, unwrap once the async thing is done. So now that we've got this, remember the point here is to try and figure out what the interface is for all of these computations that we're doing. So we look for the similar structure here. So here's kind of a similar structure. We unwrap or map, and then we do something else. So what if, for the sake of argument, we redefine all the unwraps to maps? Now we have a really similar structure on every single case. Make sense? So our first, first example was null. So how would we map a null value? So if we've got A, and A can be either 5 or null, then we've got these two paths here. Um, so if we want to restructure this into something that looks more like array mapping, how could we do that? Yeah. <laughs> this example is uh, one that I first saw from Brian Lonsdorf, and I've got some links to his stuff at the end, because um, he's got lots of interesting stuff like this. Um, and he's also pretty easy to follow. But basically, um, if instead of five or null, we have a single element array or a zero element array, now we can map over it, and we get to define our logic one time, and it either will or won't happen based on whether there's a value in that array. And if there's no value, then it just continues through the chain. Make sense? Another thing to point out here, um, our original code only had one branch. Then we added if else, or sorry, the if and then the fallback return. Um, so it made two branches. And now here we're kind of back to one branch. Um, there's really two things that can happen here, but it doesn't change the structure of the code. So if that covers null and array, what about everything else? Um, well, it turns out promises cover all of these cases. Um, so the promises already have a chainable callback uh, use case, and they've already got exception stuff built in. And async wait is just sugar for promises. So if we pretend that doesn't exist, there we go. So we've got these two types now. Um, the main functions that we care about in each of these are map and then. Um, but I'm actually going to rename one of them. Um, so instead of thinking about arrays specifically, um, we're more interested in just this map function. So we'll think of anything that might be mappable. And then instead of promises specifically, something more generic like chainables or uh, thenables or whatever. Um, but instead of then, like the JavaScript promise then is kind of weird because um, this isn't something that exists in C Sharp because you have to return a certain type from your function. It can't be this type or that type. Um, but in JavaScript, if you return a number inside your then, it just wraps it up in a promise automatically. Um, so we're ignoring that case. Bind has to return uh, the same structure that was originally chained onto. So if we're doing promises, bind has to return a promise. So if we have to return a promise, we need some way of creating them. Um, so we're going to call this little structure here a box, kind of alluding to our array box from before. Um, and this is our interface. We have map, bind, and new box. So here's the simplest box implementation. You can create them. You can map them. And they're immutable, so we create a new box. And you can bind them to other boxes uh, to chain logic together. And this box actually isn't very useful. It doesn't do anything. Um, it's not like a nullable or an optional. Um, it doesn't have any special logic for lists or anything like that. It's just 
the simplest possible box. Um, and here's an example of how you might use it. And it's not really that exciting because it didn't do anything for us. <laughs> but if you remember, this is kind of what we were after originally. This is just our business logic without any of the extra structure uh, mixed in. So what's interesting is that there are languages that have that box concept. And sort of the same way that we have async await sugar for tasks and promises, they have a similar sugar to this for that box structure. So if you remove these parentheses and we add this do right here, um, this block right here, the do is kind of like async and the backward zero is kind of like await. Um, this is a syntax sugar for chaining things together like this. So we get bind, it takes an existing box of some kind, then it takes the callback, we do the next bind, so on. So why is that useful? The first reason is that we get a simplified API. Instead of learning arrays and our languages handling of null or option or um, promises or tasks or then or whatever, um, we get this one API where we have map and bind. And if a thing says that it fits this shape, then we know how to use it. We also get simplified language syntax because we only have to build a special syntax for this one case, and we can kind of fit new things into it as we invent them. We don't need to keep adding syntax for each new type. And the third is probably the most important thing, we get simplified business logic. So if we consider this again, this really is just exactly what we wanted to do. It's the exact code from the very first slide. Um, the difference is that this will work if we have nullables or exceptions or async stuff. It's the same code. It's the thing that uses it that gets to decide uh, what kind of behavior it's doing. So here's where we reveal the secret third title. Uh, does anyone know what the other name of this box is? Besides Zach, as he's grinning. This was secretly a talk about monads, I'm sorry. <laughs> they have the exact same interface. Um, and really it's nothing more than that. It's just this box interface, it's this shape. So anything that has this shape or can be used this way, um, you can say is a monad, like you could also say it's an iChainable or something like that. Um, and all it really enables is this kind of like, I wanna do a thing, if it worked, I wanna do another thing, if it worked, I wanna do another thing. Um, and that really is the most basic type of computation because it allows us to do a thing that be chains on to many more things or to short circuit if we decide to. Um, so you can actually rebuild pretty much everything that exists uh, in a language syntax like if else and whatever um, using these structures, which I think is interesting. Um, and the languages that do have these built in and kind of like emphasize them and name them monad and all that stuff. Um, they tend to use these symbols a lot too. So if you've ever seen that before, um, they're just aliases to the same thing. So remember this from our async await with exception handling. It probably actually should have been this because this is JavaScript and anything can be null. So <laughs> what if this could just be this? And that's the talk. Any questions? Doesn't stand for anything. It's a name from math. It was like an existing concept that happened to fit. Same thing. Um, it's from category theory. So they have like names for things that are mappable. So like I want to, um, a category is like a group of things. So for example, if you just consider map all by itself, they call that a functor. It's just a thing that is a container and you can map all of the things inside to a new category. Um, so 
you can learn about that stuff in isolation without any programming, um, or you can kind of go from the other direction, programming, and learn those things. But mostly, they don't. The actual details don't matter when you're actually using the code. It's just they name them that because they have existing rules. So if, if there are any like existing logic proofs for how these two things work together, then they should hold for this too. But mostly, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the monad is a um, pattern how to the universal pattern of how to deal with the It's applicable to really any data science. If you if you can build a data structure where these three functions make sense, then it's a monad. Pure is just the constructor. Um, so like promise.resolve or array from, like it's a, just the thing that constructs one with no extra logic if you need to. Um, and it's sometimes necessary when you're doing bind because if you're binding and bind has to return the same type of thing, um, so you have a promise and you're binding, you have to return a new promise, so you need some function for um, creating another promise to return. So for example, in this case, it's assuming that use data returns the same type as the return in case here. As soon as this return type is the same as use data, they're different between the practice and parentheses. That's the only thing that's used for. Cheating sort of is the whole thing because it, you can actually deal with it. ultimately what's inside of that. Yeah, so the thing promise. The longer return the promise, the keep going. However, what's inside that box that promise is also good for the Yeah, it doesn't matter what's inside the box. Yes. I'm dead literal. Yeah. So yeah, this is kind of an introduction as to like why the abstraction could be useful. Um, I've got a bunch of links at the end here that I can share for like um, more of it. So like if you're just interested in more of those types, um, this, let's see. This one here I just put uh, for reference because it's where I got a lot of the examples from. Um, these two are where you want to look because they want to have the box. Gray box analogy. Um, this and good stuff. This one's uh, got tons of code in, so it's pretty easy to pursue. You can mostly focus on the JavaScript. Um, and this one's like a video series for the same sort of stuff. Um, and he goes over a bunch of those different types. So there's like a type for anything that is compatible, so like arrays or strings or whatever. And you can do similar useful stuff with that. Um, but yeah, it's mostly trying to like find the patterns in existing things and pull them out so that um, you can write code that's just the logic and not the extra fluff. And then I put the last three there because um, if any of this is like interesting and you, you like want to learn all of it with a very beginner intro, um, where you won't really need any other context as you're going. Um, Asco book is the best. It, it starts, like you don't even really need to know how to program to start reading that book. Um, and then the peer shape one is pretty similar, but it's more example focused. Um, it assumes a little bit more programming knowledge. And then the last one is just like, they have a tutorial. If you follow that tutorial, you'll have like a working app in the language that uses these ideas. So that could be like a beginner thing, I guess. But you probably get stuck pretty quick doing that last thing all by itself without looking at anything else. PureScript uh, is inspired by Haskell, which kind of pioneered all of the, these ideas. No, it's actually based on the type. Um, 
and it, it, I guess it sort of is a switch, but it's a switch in a dictionary of functions. Yeah, so if the return type of your function is a nullable thing, then when it compiles, it's going to use the function, it's going to use the map function from nullable. So it's kind of like interfaces um, and then implementations. If the monad is the interface, the syntax trigger works on the interface, and then you can define your own types that fit into that interface. And you can also uh, join them together. So like, if you have the example where it's that last one, um, so this is, it might throw an exception, it's async and it's nullable. Um, you could mix all those things together into one type and just you just have to find how it works in this case. So or something like that, the defaults are usually fine, but you could build your own complicated custom thing. There's similar stuff for uh, like validation and parsing logic. So if you wanted to, um, like say you got a model that came in on your API and you wanna build a validation result, so an array of errors, um, you, could, you could either have it return the first error or an array of errors just by switching the type um, that's being used around this block, if that makes sense. So like there's one implementation that short circuits and there's one implementation that concats everything together into an array. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, like the async stuff. You could say, um, I have one version that um, is sequential. I'm gonna do this and when it's done, I'm gonna do this. And you have another implementation that runs everything in parallel. That's it. Oh yeah, that's true. That's the one this time. We don't have a talk though, it's a just like a hack thing.